Um, you're always welcome to the Azure group. We do talk about Azure, but tonight we're going to talk about AI as well. Um, so Azure's got some great new AI capabilities. And I don't, I'm not going to steal too much of your thunder. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> so, so this preview. Um, so open AI uh, language models are now available in Azure. So if you want us to take use of those, so it's really easy to do because just plug straight in. I'm burning time. I don't know if you can tell I'm stalling. Good. Oh, we're good. Okay, I'm not stalling. I'm live. <laughs> okay, that's terrible. All right, so welcome everyone. Uh, Brisbane Azure User Group. So, March. Uh, first of all, without these guys, this would not be possible. So, big thank you out there to Codify and to Microsoft. So, Codify provide all the, the drinks, the pizza. They're great guys. They're awesome. They've supported us for years. They're fantastic. And Microsoft for the venue. So thanks very much, guys. Um, so without them, this would not be possible. Uh, we're really keen to get people to just talk about, you know, their experiences with Asia. You don't have to be an expert. In fact, it's better if you're not. Like we want to hear from people who are who are using the tools, who are struggling through it. Some things aren't easy in Asia, that's for sure. But I don't think anyone's going to disagree with me. I mean, maybe. <laughs> Um, but bicep is makes it a lot easier and um, and it's great. But we want to hear from you guys. So if you're keen, we've got Adam who's going to talk next month uh, about DevBox. That should be a wonderful um, talk. So definitely come on for that. But if you're keen to give a bit of a presentation, tell us about what you're doing. You know, it doesn't have to be about Azure features. It could be just be what are you doing with Azure? I'd, I'd like to hear you. Are you using, you know, app servers? How are you using app servers or, or anything else? Um, let us know. Got an email address down there. So if you flick us an email there, we'll get back to you straight away. These uh, slides are going to be made available um, after, so you don't have to try and get photos all, all at once, but you can. You're absolutely welcome to. Um, and it's a super simple email, so B-A-U-G at Outlook. Um, let us know. We'd love to hear from people in the community and get them involved. So, oh, here we go. Random slide from Dan. I'm going to flick it over to Dan because uh, <laughs> I know nothing about this slide. Uh, yeah, absolutely. If you're um, if you're looking for a new adventure, uh, we are certainly, and you have any of these skills and, and an interest in, in cloud platform, even not a you shouldn't even say this, but not even necessarily Microsoft. We also do other other cloud platforms as well. Uh, we're certainly interested in hearing from you, so you can either scan that QR code or make note of that email address, or just come and talk to me. And uh, yeah, we have um, Deloitte has some really great clients. We're we're known for solving people's wicked problems. So better than the great clients, they've got a great bunch of folks. So I can personally <laughs> test that. <laughs> It's a very good coffee machine. It's an excellent coffee machine. Yes. My apologies. <laughs> I've got a great bunch of people. Is that better? <laughs> All right. So they're really good over there. So if you're interested, check them out. All right. So a few things that um, to talk about. Azure Data Explorer, for those of you who uh, haven't seen it, it's pretty amazing technology. Um, suck in all the data, do a lot of uh, stuff with the data. But this month, we've got dashboards have gone GA. So that's pretty cool. So, you know, get a bit of visualization on that data that you're consolidating and trying to understand. Um, it's a massive lag there. Anyway. Uh, okay. So, Azure AKS, you've got uh, persistent volume resize ability. You can you can increase them, you can't decrease them. Um, but if you want to increase the, the volume size, um, that's now made a, a whole lot easier with the library sizing. Before it was a bit of a bit of a mission, you know, you had to you had to sort of pull them down, stop it, and do all sorts of stuff. But now it's just you know real time, so that's that's great. So if you're in a bind and you don't have as much storage, you want to just kind of like bump it up a little and keep your stuff running. This is really easy. Um, 
durable functions. So we've got uh, the .NET 7 framework has recently, well, quite a while back, many months ago, <laughs> has dropped. Um, so durable functions now, it's the .NET 7 and .NET 6 rolled into the one thing and it, and it allows you to do durable functions in the isolab model. Um, so if you're doing function programming, um, this is now another option, so pretty cool. Um, serverless hyperscale. Um, pretty cool. <laughs> it's a long-awaited feature. A long-awaited feature? Well, you must be more passionate than me. Maybe you can... Uh... No, no, I, like, seriously, I don't use this, so... Cool feature. Can I put you on the spot? Not so much. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> the cost optimization session last week. Cost optimization session. Okay, there you go. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Michelle. Um, so there's a couple of new VMs, uh, a little bit less memory per vCPU. So it, it just, if you've got like lower intensity workloads, you know, this is now a much more economical option if you're trying to get the right um, VMs. Pretty cool. And we got uh, confidential containers on ACI have just gone to preview. So this is pretty cool. So for those of you who are security minded, uh, this provides you know all that trusted execution environment that allows you to run containers in ACI in that trusted execution environment. So you've got that hardware based encryption on your memory and your op and everything that's executing on that um, confidential container. This is pretty cool for those who are security minded. Um, that moved? Yeah, it did. Didn't. <laughs> um, okay, so pod, so similar sort of vein. AKS, we've got pod sandboxing. It's not quite the same. So pod sandboxing is, is basically a little tiny mini VM um, on top of your VM that allows you to isolate your pods uh, to, that, to that VM. There's a, there's a bunch of caveats. Um, you know, it's it's Mariner. There's a whole bunch of stuff that that it it, it is, um, but it does protect you against those sort of breakout of um, attacks that allow you to go from one uh, execution environment to the other. And it provides that VM isolation, so that's pretty cool. Um, so we got a bit of um, Azure Container Registry. It does some caching. Um, now that, that allows you to cache from those upstream registries. So you get a little bit better performance if you're trying to um, spin up your, spin up your uh, containers, you know, a little bit of quicker execution. Oh, thanks, Dan. <laughs> um, and, and interestingly, so NetApp files now have a, up to a 500 terabyte um, file. That's massive, you know. <laughs> file size. So previously they were at, at 100. Now you can spin up a, they call it something different, did I write down there? Um, large volume files. Um, you can't take your existing uh, files that are up to 100 terabytes and you've got 100 terabytes. Wow, well done. But you can't take your existing ones and transition them up at the moment. They, they are separately provisioned um, but it is that extra space if you're using that sort of space uh, and so manage i can't even pronounce this i'm sorry guys <laughs> lust lust tree it's a it's a in memory oh sorry not in it's a high bandwidth file system so it's an open source <laughs> file system that allows um it's got solid state disk backing it and it's it's built for hpc it's it's also you can leverage it from uh, AKS as well as um, machine learning scenarios. But if you have those massive needs for super performant file systems, it's not for everything, right? So you can't use it on all the Azure stuff. Very specific. But if you are using Kubernetes, which a lot of people are, maybe this is something you can check out if you need that sort of uh, power. All right, so 
we've uh, thanks Dan. So integration down under, they're great. And um, this is a, a plug for Dan's other user group, integration down under. Uh, he said he had like a surprise slide or two. <laughs> so I'm assuming this is one of them. <laughs> it's an online webcast, so if you join us at six o'clock Queensland time tomorrow, uh, yeah, I think you'll find it. You'll find the link to the uh, actual program from the web page that has QR code things in it. So fully managed SFTP service on Azure Blob Storage. Is that that's what we're talking about tomorrow? That's correct. Hey Again, if you want to learn about that, Ray's furiously writing that down as quick as I can speak it. Maybe quicker. <laughs> Alrighty. So uh, we've got a Slack channel. So if you're interested in seeing what's going on, check out the Slack channel. It's all about Azure. We've got a YouTube channel. This is going to be on the YouTube channel, so you'll be able to see tonight's presentation and other presentations that have been done in the past. Um, there's a couple of uh, pretty cool uh, on-demand training, as well as a couple of blogs that we kind of like. Um, they're really cool. So, without any further ado. <laughs> so, Tina, I'd like to welcome you. Uh, so, Tina works for Microsoft. She's uh, in the workforce experience. Did I get that right? Workforce experience area, trying to make innovations for customers. And tonight we're going to talk about ChatGPT and OpenAI models. Thank you so much, Damon. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, I'm supposed to put this in. I think so. But this will share your share your keys. Thank you. Sure. Bear with me. Yeah, yeah, thank you. That's a brilliant idea. <laughs> that helps. Do you have many mice that match your address? Sorry, I do. You just fell down. Thank you so much, Michelle. It's a beautiful Yeah, it was it for tonight? Okay. I do not use my desktop very well. Okay. So in here. This. Then. No. Should not do this. Sorry, I need to unshare. I can use. I think this would work better if I went present in Teams. There's the pink card. Present in Teams? Yes. If you want to yes. online. You'll have to upload it to OneDrive first. Ah, okay. Thanks for reminding me. Okay, so we don't have that at the moment. So let's just go like this. Mm. Um, oh, that's perfect. Yeah. And then I can present <laughs> this. Oh yeah, this is great. Is this the one up there? Yeah. Oh, this one. It is good. Okay. Awesome. Wonderful. Hello everyone. I'm Tina. Thank you so much for coming here today to listen to me. Uh, and um, on today, which is the International Women's Day. So really, really, really appreciate. Before we dig in, could you all please, please stand up for me and put your hands together for all the women in the room? Sure. Like that. Yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you very, 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 very much. I'd just like to correct a little bit, um, or before we go there, um, how many of you? Have heard of ChatGPT? Well, we have a few rooms, a few hands uh, that haven't gone up. It's okay. After today, you will know what it is and what it can do and what you can't do yet. And a little bit of um, mud me, uh, correction from what Damien was saying. I used to work at Microsoft. 
but now I have moved on and I have founded um, a company <laughs> called Build Rice. So what do we do? Feel free to follow us on LinkedIn. I would really appreciate. We really want some more followers. But what do we do is we do a peer-to-peer AI-powered organizational intelligence solution. So um, if you want to know more about it, please please follow us on uh, link LinkedIn, ask more questions. We would love to interact and uh, answer any of your queries around that. And um, I share, as um, Damien shared on his slide as well, I do a lot of um, technical and not so technical organization employee experience and um, workplace related or hybrid related uh, posts all the time. So feel free to follow me on LinkedIn as well if you like to hear more about that. Okay, tonight, let's talk about what we're gonna do tonight. So what we're gonna start with is OpenAI. What is it? And why do we need to care about it? I think most of you know why we need to care about it, but we will talk about it a bit. Then we'll talk about ChatGPT 3 a bit, and then we'll jump into how we can use OpenAI and Azure together to make the most of it. Thereafter, we'll talk more about how Microsoft is bringing OpenAI services into Azure. So how within Azure you can actually use OpenAI services and why is it better or if it is better. <laughs> and then we'll have an open forum and talk about any questions you have uh, from the presentation or any, anything else. Almost. <laughs> um, how we're going to do it is with demos and a lot of demos. So I'm going to stop presenting the screen and while I'm doing this shift, Feel free to throw any questions at me. I would uh, be, I think I can do multitasking, or I should be able to in a moment. It's better. Okay, so a lot of people have heard about OpenAI. On their website, they say it's creating safe artificial intelligence. I think it's more than safe. It's a lot more, or maybe even slightly different than safe. It's about accessibility. We have not had a OpenAI, or not OpenAI, we have not had an AI model with a presentation layer, with a beautiful, incredible user experience layer available to the people all over the world. Just go in, you have so much credit, or to go in and try and try for any purpose with confidence that it is available to um, open to any questions, any prompts, you name it. And we've seen it all over LinkedIn, internet, everywhere, how variety of um, questions people have asked. I, mean, I asked it to write a poem for my for my dog uh, after telling uh, telling it that um, you know that's the name of my dog and this is a breed and it did. And that's incredible. So what we've got here is a very accessible model that has been made available through a very simple to use, easy to use, accessible to people, um, and performant uh, model available. And now that's one part of it. But then the second part of it is that it is one of the best natural language processing model that has been out there. So if you ask a question, it's not followed by, you know, did you write the English properly? Or, you know, what did you mean by it? Or, you know, is it really what, you, like, if you ask something, it actually almost interprets it perfectly in terms of what your intention is, what question is, even though you are asking your question in natural language, like normal human English. I don't know if it's available in other languages, but definitely English. 
It is? There you go. Wonderful. Have you tried it? Yeah, I did. How did it go? What did you... Uh, okay, you were, you were switch, switch yourself into that vendor and talk to you that vendor. Oh, wonderful. There you go. That's amazing. And um, was there the chat to the that you mainly uh, used yeah. in the language? Yeah. Oh, wonderful. Perfect. That's a great segue. Let's get into the next thing that we're going to talk about today. And that is the... Actually, no, that's not the chat. <coughs> Sorry. Don't need... You don't feel the need, but to respond to this immediately. But when it says general intelligence, I don't know that that's really true at the moment. I think there's a context to what natural process, natural language processing can do, but it is really, really quite amazing. So that's amazing that you bring this point. I, I don't know which one because I'm reading four at a time, but one of the books that I'm reading to, uh, at the moment is. <laughs> Yes, um, one of the books was it's um, it was comparing skill or knowledge with uh, with action, and it was calling action as the intelligent part. It's, as human beings, we take action, and up until we do action or we think about the complex complexity of the multiple skills and behavioral information or environmental information that we observe, that's not. Um, really intelligence, and then we get into intelligence with multiple types again, so let's not go there. But the skill by itself is not intelligence in its complete entirety. And I agree with you, sorry, Bill, uh, that it is definitely uh, the skill. And even a qualifier on that, what they have is uh, all information available on internet all the way up to 2021. So that's also a disclaimer that it does not have information after that. So if you need information after that for what you're trying to achieve through your, um, you know, for your business need or your personal need or your, your application need, you have to uh, complement it. You have to augment it with additional information, which is what you can do with a number of ways. Um, okay, so I haven't lost my mouse. Before we um, go further, any questions up until here? Now, you're all good. Lovely. Um, okay. So, it's interesting because I'm only taking that now. So, what you're looking at, is it clear? Can yeah. everyone see? See? It? <clears throat> Lovely. So, this is something that they are calling playground, and I would highly encourage you to go and check it out. Um, let's maybe, you know, use this link as quite an important one. Go do play if you're interested in OpenAI in general. Forget about ChatGPT for now. If you're interested in what, what OpenAI are doing, please, please, please go to this link, uh, platform.openai.com slash playgrounds. And why it is important is it has a number of pre-selected prompts available. So let's make a selection. Would you like to pick one? What should which one should we try? Let's not go for the chat because we're going to do more of that later. So. Summarize for a second, Brina. Oh, that would be amazing. We have to put a lot of text to summarize. But sure, let's give it a go. Who's going to write all that text now? <laughs> okay, so this seems like a bit of a text about solar system and Roman God. Okay, cool. And it's um, reduced it from how much was it? Like twice as much to um, about you know three sentences. And does it make sense? You picked it. Pretty good. You tell me. <laughs> much easier good. to read. Yeah. Yeah. You can read it. It's easy enough to read. Oh, uh, when it's been uh, summarized for a second grader, it's just so much clearer. Oh wow. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, it had things like, you know, square bracket 20 before. Yeah. Can we bring up a quantum physics uh, paper and just put it through that, please? <laughs> Do you have one handy? <laughs> the maximum length to maximum length. Maximum length. So that's the number of tokens you can, um, you get back. So when you make a request, these are some of the settings here. And these settings are available to you for playing in the playground. 
but also available to you in when you're working with the APIs. So some of the important ones here to note about is the temperature. Temperature is a really good one because if you put it down to zero, it will play very safe. Okay. It will give you very much like for like for what you're asking and it will not really take a risky move for you. But if you start increasing the temperature, it would go um, and give you some intelligent, if I could use that word here, intelligent information from its perspective. And six or seven is more like a recommended one. Otherwise, if you go to zero, you're really looking for a database kind of work performance. This data is just providing you back the data. There's less of intelligence there. Uh, maximum length token is what you want returned uh, in terms of your response. So you could um, tell it 256 is the standard one, um, or sometimes you, you can, I think you can increase it. Sorry? It counts as tokens, so words are not really calculated as words. It counts words as tokens. So if the word is English, it will probably break the English word into three or four tokens. Different words, depending on how it calls um, them. They're, every token is about two to three characters or so, and it breaks different words into different tokens. And that's how it measures and calculates um, your bill as well. So if you pass on a query or a prompt, like we put the question in right it it breaks those words into certain characters each tokens and the number of tokens is your bill you charge very minimally very very minimally per token but you can imagine the number of tokens you go in is huge significant so over time you're paying for the tokens that you're pushing putting in in terms of your ask i'm not entirely sure if when you get a response those tokens are counted towards your bill as well or not so I don't think so. Open <coughs> account or is this a charging account already? Um, We're talking about cost. Um, that's a very good question, and I don't have a simple answer to that, but I'll try. So I joined as a simple uh, as a normal account quite some time ago. I was very interested. So now if you go in, you might have a bit less and you might get a little less credit, but I joined it some time ago and I still have, they gave me about $18. And I think I've only used six dollars, and I've used it fair bit uh, over time. So there is measure, but so I didn't pay for the credit card. It will, but for me at that point, it not, did not take the credit card. And then the next thing for me and for anyone of you who are actually in um, a, a company or you are in a um, small business or a startup, which was my case. You can actually apply for Microsoft for startups and they give you a lot of money. So I have a lot of money which hasn't come through yet, but I'm getting some free money from there as well that you can use. And I think if I'm just testing and developing, that money would last me for a while. It's a lot of money, uh, open AI credit money as well um, that you can get from that way. Um, Where did you check your account? Oh, sure. Um, so right at the top there, it says Landmines. That's the name of my company. And um, if I go there, let's see, I click on manage account. And uh, so it gives me some of that. And that was the $18 I got. I still have a fair bit to go. <laughs> and you can see my usage as well. So for today, I was doing some prep on, not yesterday, but the day before. But then before that, uh, if I go before March, I probably, oh, there you go. 1st of February, I did a lot of work. Uh, that's probably when I got it, but since, um, yeah, a little bit before that. But so you can, just like any of the, as, as your Azure subscription or any of those, you can see that here as well. There are some other things which are quite important. I won't click on, is my mouse? After the 1st of April, it will be charged normally, is that what you think? Um, Yes, uh, if my other credit doesn't come through. So there are some options through which you can get the credit. So it's in the process. I'm hoping it will come back. If not, then I'll just provide this, the credit card and then it will be consuming the credit card. For example, uh, one of the other models that I wanted to show you today was um, this Dell E1. Um, and I have exhausted my credits. As I said, that I do use a lot of, um, uh, a lot of, um, I do a lot of posting on articles and things like that. And for every article to make it a little bit catchy, I produce some images and to have a good image without having to pay royalty anywhere. I just go to Dali and um, get, get it to make an image for me. And sometimes it takes me a while to get the right image that I want for my article. So um, I use credits while I'm producing images. So 
it is I've lost all the credits. I don't have any, but I will get a refill on 11th of March. <coughs> but that's only for Delhi. It's not the same for um, the OpenAI. So OpenAI has three main models that we are working um, that that are really taken everyone by you know uh, excitement. And ChatGPT three is one of them. That is the one that everyone's been using. Dal E is another one, uh, and the, it's called three because it's the third version of the natural language processing um, uh, model that they've come up with, and that's this is one of the most efficient one that they have. So Dal E is the next one, which produces images. So it won't produce the image, but I can show you what it would be like. So if I go, you know, surprise me, it just puts some of the words together in terms of the kind of image. Is it bad? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so you just put it in, and um, if you have already gone to or not, I'll show you on my LinkedIn profile. The or actually it was the old picture, so let's not go there. But the old picture that I had on my LinkedIn profile, the header that that actually I created from that. So I asked for it. Give me a woman on Mars with, with uh, wearing metaverse glasses. That's how I created the picture. It was like red soil with some bricks on it, and a really lovely lady was sitting on one of the bricks and had uh, metaverse headsets that were nothing like any of the ones that are in production right now. Like it was just pointy ones. So you can get some really cool images as well, depending on what you ask it for. So if you clicked on history. Will that show us some of the ones you've worked with? It would have, and I was hoping to, yeah. even though could have been controversial, uh, but I changed my account. <laughs> um, as I said, I was working for Microsoft but very recently. I've actually changed. So my account was a Microsoft account. And uh, since I did not have access to it anymore, I changed it to my new company account. So it wiped off the history. Even though it's the same account, it kept the same payment and everything because the username uh, changed or it thought that the user has changed. All my history is gone. So, I don't have any of the old pictures. Some of them are good. So it costs for the Azure subscription credits. Uh, Azure input. Sort of. mm, yes and no. So how it works is, um, which is one of the things we're going to talk later, but let's just talk about it now. Uh, so what you will have is you will have um, open AI models available as Azure services, just like any other, you know, all those beautiful VMs and all the other things that we were looking at, they will be available from Azure. They are right now, they're calling it GA, but it's really preview and it's only available to select group of people. So um, if you are special enough, not sure who you work for and if they have a good, you know, special arrangement, um, then you might have access. And then through that, you will have, um, you, you will have. I'm assuming some free credit through there as well, some Azure credit to use towards OpenAI services, but I haven't seen them myself. I've tried to get in a few times, but I haven't made it in yet. Uh, but it is available to Microsoft managed some accounts. They're making it available, but um, yeah, so I have personally not seen it. But I wouldn't see any reason why you won't be able to just use your subscription credit once you are using them. Okay, um, any questions on Delhi? Not that we can do much before. Okay. the picture, Gina. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Wow, there you go. That's, down there. That's the red Mars picture. <laughs> oh, the internet keeps everything. Thanks, <laughs> Yogi. <laughs> oh, okay, cool. So, this is another one that I wanted to show you guys. and. Um, so if you are a buddy developer, or if you have no experience in development ever before, this is really your friend. I could literally go to it and tell, and type, oops, there we go, build me a mobile web app, oops, not three, and yeah. Really, literally, start writing for them. <laughs> <laughs> I can ask it more things as well. <laughs> and it will do that. 
I asked it to create me a, let's see if I, um, it, it doesn't happen again, but I can try it. I asked it to create me a LinkedIn login button and it created the login button. Create a LinkedIn login button then clicked prompt LinkedIn user name, something like that. So Okay. Anything you want, you want to put it together, start an app, and then once you are done with it, you click on that and it will bring it up where you can actually test. Nice. Right then and there. I actually met someone who created a JavaScript app uh, in three years all by herself without having any technical experience ever before. She's a founder and running her business now. It's actually uh, called Paco, and it um, is a 3D uh, model building software based on JavaScript. And if she had access to this when she started, I'm pretty sure it wouldn't have been any more than six months at max. Yeah. <laughs> Does it only have JS? Can it? No. Times Square Everything. Everything. So, well, a lot of things. So let's go back into where we were in our playground. If we go here, oh, playground. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Sure. That's I'll a good. three tabs across this one. Oh, okay. Cool. Yeah. So this is one of the ones here is the Python one as well. Natural language to Python. So here, this is what I actually used when I was doing it for the first time because I am or at least when I started, I wasn't a Python developer. And um, so I got into Python and uh, started doing some of the work that was needed to train uh, open AI models using the Python from here. So here, if I, uh, so this one just saying, create a list of names, create a list of first name, last name, and combine them randomly into 100 full names. And we want it to write Python. Let's change the formatting to Python as well. And then if I click Submit, Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it does work. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that they can process multiple languages because I use a lot of multiple programming languages. I'm more asking if they have any sandbox for other uh, languages. Um, no, but I would uh, consider the playground as a sandbox as well, right? That's just the name. Uh, but in this model as well, you can create this. And if you want to actually, uh, it lets you pick some more as well. So if you want to go more examples, you can go and pick from some of these examples that they have. They've got quite a few um, examples as well. But then what you can do is each of these examples is nothing but uh, a prompt, a good prompt that you're providing it with the kind of answer you're looking for, and then it provides you the answer based on that. So if you're asking for, you know, let's just go for a Q&A, if I want to open Q&A in a playground, if I'm asking a particular type of questions and I'm telling it, so these are all the prompts that are framing the scope for it, for you, if I can say that. So what it already has, as we talked about, information all the way to 2021, including all programming languages, all history, skills of different kinds. And then what we do in our prompt is tell it that if, if I ask a question like this, you need to provide an answer like this. So if we tell it that this is, if I ask for writing you an application like this, you need to write it in language C, C++, or something like that, like this. And then next question, if you ask, write me a code in C++ of that, I have no doubt that it will actually produce that. So if we go a little bit deeper into it, we can potentially do it. <laughs> Um, okay, we kind of uh, hitting the time, and we haven't even done 
to do one topic. So um, this is the chat GPT part. Do you guys want to have a little bit of a play with this as well? Yeah. yeah. What you have in mind? <laughs> well, you tell me, what would you like to ask? <clears throat> How about an inappropriate request? Mm. <laughs> Which shall be my guest. <laughs> Uh, it actually has, it, it, it will say no. So, um, well, let's ask a yes thing first. So, what would we like to ask? Um, tell me about the VMs available in Azure. Hope it tells me that. This one that we have answered till 2021. Yes, so it may not show you the VMs that Damien was showing you. <laughs> but still, I, that's the only question that came to my mind. Uh, you know, short term memory. Um, but what we'll do is after it's finished, we'll ask an inappropriate question as per Michelle's um, Michelle's request. And show you that you know it won't work, but let's show you that it does work first. Is that, uh, is that actually generating that text or is it basically just pre-parroting what it finds on the internet? And it's a pure generation. It's, it's generation. It's generation. It's generation. So it basically finds the documentation that it needs to and then, and then rephrases it? And so um, yeah, so the information exists and based on the um, the question that we are asking, it's, it's pulling it together and providing it in a succinct manner. So if we'd asked only about the best VM, it probably would have given us a different answer. Um, but it would be more like, I mean, I'm not an AI expert. I've just been playing with an AI services. So I'm not sure how um, the learning versus just a database at the ground level really compares, but it's based on learning and less on information sourcing. This is, this is where there is some controversy as well as because it's legal or not. Uh, I hope uh, I hope I get to come back here and not prison for doing this. <laughs> so this is like um, copying copyrighted text. Oh, I don't know. Yes, because if you type the same question again, it will give you a different answer. Probably will because um, it for, for yeah, multiple it's, reasons. It's, it's because this thing has scanned the copyright. Just right. wow. So my brother in law's experience, he had a copyright writer who he wasn't happy with, so he got ChatGPT to write a, uh, uh, a copyright statement for his site, and he used the search engine, not in depth of Microsoft, so I went to search the net for phrases and couldn't find them anywhere. It was, as far as he's concerned, it was completely new, newly generated. But if you've got the case that you're saying that it's you yeah, know, it is a case under the rest right now. That's um, that's a good good thing to know as well. So you know we can't and when you do do work with it, it uh, or when you log in, because uh, I'd already logged in, it didn't show you that message. It shows you some disclaimer statements, and one of those disclaimer statements is um, that we will be monitoring your because we're trying to make the model more better and we're learning. Um, it will actually be learning on your uh, questions and conversations that you're doing as well. So do not type anything sensitive. So at this point, and especially in the um, in the free account, uh, it, it's not uh, really, um, yeah. Um, but you're, to, to your point, um, Ranjan, um, that, uh, you know, it was, uh, it will generate new yeah, one. I've read that. Um, it, it gives me three different articles. Absolutely. On because it thinks every time you ask the same question again, it thinks that that which answer was not uh, sufficient enough. It wasn't right enough. So it tries to autocorrect and you know meet your expectations every time you do that. And that's the same with the image thing as well. For the same phrases, if you go regenerate, regenerate, it will keep providing you new, new images that it tries to match more closely with your question. In the platform, does the temperature help mm -hmm. control how creative it is? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So even um, I haven't tried this with the APIs because I did not have access to the chat GPT-3 through APIs, but I have um, uh, I had access to some of their other models that they're about making available for fine tuning from APIs. 
and the temperature made a huge difference. Yeah. So when you change the temperature, it, it changes. And even the UI, which we were doing the, um, the playground, if you change the temperature, it does make a difference. Um, I did promise to ask an inappropriate thing as well. So let's let's ask it. Um, so if I ask it, should I buy my oh, it doesn't teach me this. <laughs> Sorry? Got one pre-prepared, have you? Oh no, I, I I actually did not ask this question before. I've asked the question because I was interested in it. Yeah. Uh, should I buy gold or not? Yes. And it didn't. It gave me a bad, you know, that kind of answer. But today I was going to ask, it, should I buy Microsoft shares? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we can try or Apple. What like? What should we do? Oh, we can try that. Why not? Should I buy Bitcoin today? <laughs> oh, wait, there you go. It's actually suggesting me, uh, but it's not going to answer me. I'm pretty sure. Oh no, I did spell it right. Sorry. More correct. Oh, there you go. <laughs> Bitcoin. Wait, thank you. <laughs> Bitcoin. Uh, that's pretty good. Question mark as well. Make it easier for it. Are you better than Google? <laughs> That's exactly what I told it told me for gold as well. Ah, oh, cool. So does it is it being preloaded with topics that it's not allowed to talk about, or is it deciding whether or not it can talk about something? Like I think it's uh, it falls into the same thing. Is it copying text or dance question as well? And um, um, Would you say the same for gold or? I tried gold before and that's Do kind of what yeah I got the similar kind of thing for gold as well but the thing is like if I uh, had asked the question about like we could yeah, try that want to go down I there but tried it for real estate um asking which area <laughs> should I are you are you looking to buy Michelle maybe <laughs> <laughs> but, 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 let's talk about it later What's the next you RPA? Play with play. it. How about we move to our next topic because there's a technical component that I want to get through. But please do, we will share this after as well, but please do take this um, URL. You can play for as long as you want with it. Any questions you want to ask. There might be a wait list. At, at some time ago, there was a wait list to join in, but you know, even if that is the case, just put your name down and you'll get it soon enough. Uh, but yeah, just chat.openai.com slash chat. Even if you miss the URL, you go here and learn about and then follow the try prompt. You will get there. That's one of their most popular one and they land you there. Uh, quite uh, always. Sorry, a question to the audience. Has anyone got a question where it hallucinates? Just dreams up stuff that's not real? Does anyone take that experience? Sorry, I couldn't hear your question. Rick. Has anyone got a question where it hallucinates? It dreams up stuff that doesn't actually exist. So Max have answers. Uh yeah. Yeah. Oh, it's URLs. <laughs> it doesn't oh, actually oh, have access to like so it'll actually make up whatever it thinks the web page is based on the URL. Yeah. You can have a go. Why not? What well, is not, it? Not now, later, it's not fair later since it's Okay, cool. Awesome. So I promised that this was uh, open AI in Azure. So I'm going to quickly show you what I have been kind of doing with it. So OpenAI is available um, uh, through APIs. So actually, let's go into the documentation a bit, and I'll show you where you can start with this kind of stuff. So when you, where we were on the playground, you just click on the documentation, you get all their documentation. And that's, it's not really big, heavy to read documentation, it's very light, uh, but it will give you some very cool things to do. And one of the ones that really got my attention and what I've used for doing all my Azure work and all my, uh, my augmenting, so you've got OpenAI model and now you want to do something for business. Did you have a question? No. no. <laughs> cool. you, you want to do it for a business purpose, how to augment that with OpenAI? That's something that I learned from here as well, and that's through the topic fine tuning. So fine tuning, if you just even search for fine tuning OpenAI, 
will probably get here. And this is just in their documentation. It's very, very, very helpful. And that really would help you design your applications for that purpose, even if uh, it becomes available or when becomes available in Azure as Azure services as well. This is exactly what you'll need to do. So if we scroll through this a bit, what it does is, um, do we have any Python developers in the room? This one? Or um, data analyst? <laughs> OK, that's all right. We have a couple. <laughs> OK, so I wasn't one at all, uh, but I just followed these instructions and I was totally fine. I even have <coughs> Anaconda. Anaconda now, so if you don't know, Anaconda is a uh, command prompt tool. It does many other things as well, but it's like a IDE, but command based um, IDE for doing Python. Did I say it right? Does it? Is that right? Okay, cool. It makes it easier because if you do it in um, normal PowerShell, you might have to get a lot of things and it just makes it a little bit harder. When I uh, was doing it in PowerShell, it was uh, a bit complicated. A lot of things were just not really behaving as they should. I got Anaconda and straight up, it was working perfectly. So if you're just getting into it, um, they should pay me for promoting it, but they don't. But mm -hmm. anyway, it was good. Uh, so once you get that, once you have a good Python or uh, PowerShell tool to run some command, uh, you need to install or upgrade OpenAI. Once you've done that, uh, there's something called OpenAI key. So what you get is in your account, I won't, do, uh, I won't actually go to um, generate one or show you one because that won't be good. I'll have to regenerate one. But just like uh, most um, app secrets and keys that you do in Azure app registration. You actually have a API key in um, in your OpenAI account. Once you have that, then you use that for command prompt or your um, application. If you are building a front end or you know, a desktop application and you're using OpenAI APIs, you'll be using that, um, that key. So that's where that key would go as a command. And then once you've done that, uh, you would prepare it. You would need to prepare a data in a format that they call JSON L. And I don't know if it is a standardized format outside OpenAI as well, but basically it's a JSON lines one after the other, and they, that is a JSON L format. So every line here is a, is a valid JSON. And then after that, you have, uh, and, and there's just lines of them without any comma in the end. No, uh, unlike JSON, so it's, that's JSON L. Each line has uh, two key value pairs. One is the prompt and the other one is completion. And this ties in with what we were talking about in the UI before that you tell it that this is a if this is a question, I want this kind of answer. If this is a kind of question, I want this kind of answer. This is your training data. For your organization, for your application, if you want to train it with some data, this is your training data. So you prepare it depending on whatever your scenario is uh, that you that you're trying to solve for using some of the information, some of the um, qualities of the base model and then adding your more information on it. So that's how you'll prepare your data. Now, if you have prepared a CSV and you don't really want to do that um, JSON L by hand, they also provide you a um, uh, command, uh, command line tool that you can use. So OpenAI tools, the prepare data that converts the CSV file into JSONL for you. So you don't have to do that. Um, and then the next step is uh, you basically uh, create the fine tune. So you call um, through command prompt or through the APIs uh, from any application. You tell it that um, I want to uh, create a fine tune based on a base model. That base model, it would be amazing if it was ChatGPT3, but it is not available right now. There are a bunch of ones that are available that they are uh, previous ones that have different kinds of good and bad features, or good or not so good features, uh, but ChatGPT is not available as a base model at the moment. It, they're saying that it will become. It is available. It is now? It's yeah, so ChatGPT 3.5 Turbo. Okay, it's available as a base model to train on. Um, Sure, yeah. Okay, that's interesting because um, uh, when I was trying it 
did not, and their documentation didn't say that either. Uh, but see in here, that's what it's saying. So you can use Ada, Babbitt, Curie, and DaVinci. These are the base models you can train on, but if it, I did read somewhere it was coming soon enough. So I think it just came out a few days ago. There you go. You're, you're, you must be right. <laughs> Lovely, I mean, thank I, you. I couldn't find any up and done, um, but it's definitely available. It's, yeah. Awesome. And ready to try that now. That's good. <laughs> it was my credit. <laughs> cool. So that's what you do in your base model. Uh, and then this is the path to the file that you just prepared. So you tell it that this is my training data in JSON L format. This is the base model. And then you let it do its thing. Um, it might, as it tells you as well, that it might you know, pause in the middle in terms of giving you the information of where it is, but it's doing it in the background. So after you can always reprompt it and it can tell you if it's been done and things like that, uh, which you can do by this. So if you've lost the command prompt, you can always go and check and follow. If it's the small information, it takes like two minutes. I haven't had a model uh, uh, like I've put up to 1000 lines as training. I haven't had any more than five minutes of wait. So within five minutes, it, it processes and creates a fine tune for me. Um, from there. So. Um, then there are just certain API things, how you can prompt it and some uh, other languages and how you want to delete those things and stuff like that. Um, but then once you've done this process, it becomes available in your models to choose from. So for example, I've got here these two models I prepared earlier. <laughs> and if I, so if I go with any of these models, let's try this one. Um, I have been working with a particular scenario. And so what I've been trying to do is um, I wanted to do an end to end presentation here. So I have a tendency, an M365 tendency. So a little bit of my technical background before I got into this. It was not too long ago. I spent a number of years doing M365 now uh, and all its previous versions for a number of years. So I have a thing for M365 and all the good things that it comes with. So what I did was I um, took some information. Let's just jump into what I did in. I'm good at losing math. Oh, there you go. So that's probably a good time to jump into Azure. So what I did was in here, I went to using Azure integration services, Logic App being one of the options. I went to the graph APIs and <coughs> I took all the users and I passed actually, I want to show you some bits and data. There we go. Let's look at this one. So I made a graph APIs request asking for all the users. So that returned me all the users. I should be one of them. Um, after I got them, this is the Fast information. So um, there's eight of the users in my tenancy. So I've set up te um, eight test users. And for each of those test users, I went and made another graph APIs request, getting more information. And that more information was uh, here. But that, so there you go, Donna Gates is one of them. I went and got their, some additional information. So here I've got their skills. So I have a Microsoft 365 tenancy. I made uh, a logic app to go and get some data from it for my users. And that particular information is their names and their skill set. Got all of that. And then I made something like a prompt. So this is my prompt. So right now, instead of using the OpenAI tool to going and creating um, from Excel, from a handcrafted CSV to a JSONL file, I'm creating that JSONL file in my logic app. 
with the real data that I have in some other application. And this one, it happens to be M365. Um, and I'll take a bit of that through graph APIs. Um, and then after I've created all of that, uh, I am uploading that file. It's a little bit trickier if you are doing it in the logic app instead of the command <laughs> prompt, because in command prompt, you just provide the path in the um, uh, in, in a HTTP request in Logic Apps, you just have to set boundaries and then upload the uh, content of the file. Once you've done that, uh, it becomes a file in um, uh, OpenAI account, and then you call the find here. So this is exactly what we were looking at in the documentation, and we could have done through um, in a command prompt a, for Python. And now instead of doing that as a command we're passing in, sitting and waiting. We could actually do it through integration services and then all the benefits of integration services when you want it to run, what kind of data you want it to run. Do you want new information to go in or old information to go in? Do you want some additional business line of business application data to go with it? All the benefits you have with your Azure and integration services or other applications that you have in Azure, you can bring that in together here. Um, once you've done that, you will have your fine-tuned model. You do provide the base one. Right now, in this particular example, I have the base one as the one I created as well because I just wanted to train it more. So similar to how they are doing with their model, like they have a model and they're telling us in a disclaimer that, you know, whatever you're typing in, we're going to be using it for training. You could actually, um, I think I put Damien to sleep. <laughs> Um, no, so uh, actually, please feel free to ask questions. We are a bit over time as well. Um, um, please, please. I'm, I'm pretty sure that Azure uh, AI solutions have quite similar services. I couldn't remember which one is specific, but we definitely can provide the tech data to train them and fine tune them. And what, what's the benefits by using this rather than using the uh, Asia native ones because you, you you are not using the I would say the, the most powerful feature of this open AI you, you are just training your own data right so think so, about a scenario where you would like the uh, the robustness of because what we just when we started we said that one of the best things about uh, chat GPT three in particular is the robustness of natural language processing now there's Many similar models existing in Azure native uh, services natively and some of the other competitive products as well. But by and large, it is one of the best natural language processing. So now we know that if anything a human interaction would say, it can process it beautifully. Now, like for example, a, comp a similar product is Nuance, where we're doing it from voice to text. So that's amazing for doing voice to text, right? Now we know about ChatGPT, it's amazing to interpret text and then provide the responses. Interpret the intention, interpret the English in terms of the kind of information that the user is actually looking for or an action that user is looking to do. Now, but we also saw that the limitation is your information is up to a particular year. You're not allowed for certain kinds of questions. Now, for your corporate environment, if you need to provide this kind of solution for a particular purpose, like one of the common ones is uh, policies. Policies are so complex, so huge, and so many. And the larger the organization gets, the more the policies are, and sometimes they're older and newer. Uh, similar to what we used to do as a document management system or a collaboration tool back in the days, now you can make it so much more easier. If I'm looking for a policy for, say, purchase of cars i don't need to worry about what is everywhere i just ask for that and then it will give me that information i could even say um, that would be applicable or maybe combine it with some uh, government legislation in a particular area which i think you would say yeah, that yeah. that's not latest i understand in, in general how open ai is a lot more powerful than <clears throat> major AI, ai solutions but what you are um, demoing here is you have your own training data, right? Just prompts and answers, questions and answers. And when you train that, I can say that's like, uh, I don't know, it's like a board or something, you just ask some related questions and it will give you answers based on those 
trend data. It won't give you any okay, you X. For uh, not just data, you could ask for interesting. So Dan here, uh, if I picked up right, Dan, you work from the, for Deloitte. Yes. There you go. So Deloitte is a very large uh, top tier consulting company. They do a lot of project work. They get teams together quickly, and those teams need to deliver on the client because they could be charging a lot of money to deliver uh, on, on that project outcome. And those projects could be, or those clients could be all of the place. So what if I want to get a project team together for um, delivering a you know, mining project located in uh, central Queensland with experience, um, uh, with, with good gender diverse spread, as well as uh, a uh, background and experience in uh, rural areas. So now we're talking about a location that somebody putting the team together in the UK may not really know what it is like to be in central Queensland. That information can come from ChatGPT, but what people you have and what are the skill sets of these people and what is the um, what is the project? What are the projects that they've worked on? That's an M365 or some other tool that you might have. And you bring all of that together. Then that tool, you ask it, can you recommend me a team that is available quickly to pick up this project and will be efficient on day one? So were you saying the model you just trained will come to yeah. the general knowledge from open oh, AI yeah. and your specific? Yeah, uh, some we're augmenting oh, right. it. We're not creating a new one. That's right. Sorry, I should have led with that. And, and we are doing that, and we're, we're looking at melding that research data to be able to ask questions like that. We should talk about it. This, that's exactly my solution here is. So if I could go in my app, this is the app that I was building. <laughs> so let's build a team for an open AI powered, with an open AI powered team builder. So some of the things that I have here, recommend me a scrum team for uh, from the company. So the reason I'm putting it in the company is, is it's not. <laughs> <laughs> it's, enough, it's learning. Uh, but the thing here is that uh, the reason I put from the company is because if I don't put it from the company, it will start giving me local people. Yep. Okay. So I have to scope in my questions, and it knows when you're scoping your questions the kind of things that you're looking for. So now if I go like you know shape and resource might be different, or if I just go give me a uh, project team. From the company. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> I did add other people, so uh, yeah. They got nice skills. They got nice skills. But the, but the idea is it's um, yes. Yeah, so that's kind of and this is just a local app that I got um, just picked up from an example. So if you want to start playing with it, the page that we were on and we were looking at the documentation. You can add um, with Tina. Sorry? Have you met me somebody whose name doesn't start with Tina? Yeah, I'm doing most of the work. Maybe that it thinks oh, yeah. everyone else is on a lead now. So. <laughs> um, okay, so right at the bottom, if you want to play with it, it has apps. So there is a very cool one here. That's kind of what I started with as well. Um, yeah. I will share that with you. Um, just excuse me for that. I don't know why I can't find it. It's somewhere in the documentation, but it's a sample app. And if you just download it and run it in Visual Studio, you'll just have to get no, um, install Node and then just uh, do the npm run to have a local version running. Um, what it does is it's a very cool app. It tells you, it asks you for uh, a type of the animal, and then it recommends you three names for uh, for for that animal. So you type in horse, it gives you certain names. And this is um, and what it does, peek, give you a peek into the code as to how easy this is to get again. So just being pink doesn't mean it's good. <laughs> okay. Oh, there you go. I'm back. So, so all you need to do to once you've created your model, you need to use that model. 
So this is sorry if it's is it too small? Can you see it? So <laughs> that's similar to how we did in um, the playground and how we did in um, you know the, the test uh, as well. So you provide the number, you provide the temperature, you provide how many max tokens you want to get back, and you provide the temperature. Stop sequence is a good one. I found the stop sequence to be really good because otherwise it was just giving me multiple sentences um, that I didn't really need. It will give me two, three teams. I didn't really need two, three teams. So that worked as well. So you can have all kinds of stop sequences as well. You can have a colon, semicolon, all kinds of stuff. Uh, so that's kind of where it's doing the calling of the model. This is the one it was doing with um, the animals. So even though it um, had the right model that it was asking, we were still giving it in the code, in the user interface, you're just providing say parse or something like that. But in the code, it's actually giving it some additional pro um, prompt to give it the context, similar to that question answer thing we were looking at. Like if I say animal cat, give me something like that. If I say dog, give me something like that. And now the animal is whatever the user typed in. Let's see what you give me now. So you give it, you set the context because the model could do a lot more than what you're asking for. So every time you want to ask a question, give it a few question answers, and then it will know where exactly the kind of information or kind of work that they're asking you to do. So the one that I had eventually, see I was training and I put too many things in there. <laughs> so these kind of question answer, question answer that I need. Um, yeah, but uh, I think those were most of the things. I did promise that I will give some time for questions. We did have some, but any more? Um, about the cost. So if you're using a pre-trained model, wouldn't that be 60 times more expensive than using the ChatGPT API? What do you mean by pre-trained? Um, we do the fine tuning for the model. Yes. So that it's, um, I think like three cents per token, but the point three cents per token to train for, for training it. And then to actually do the recall, it's uh, six times more expensive than just do, using the DaVinci. So if you compare that, because ChatGPT can sort of do the same thing, uh, user system, user system, user system, um, but the tokens are 10 times cheaper than DaVinci. You will only fine tune if you want to augment. Well, my view is this. This is just my view. I'm sure there are other options too. But my view is you will only augment if you're looking to build a solution for your organization with the, the information that is not already available in the base model. If it is not, if it's your corporate information, like policies or like people. I was just reading what other people are doing. It's called text embedding, where you embed the information in, say, the very front, one of the first um, prompts. And then you can use that information in so the very first. But uh, think chat. about the prompts are going to cost you the same. So if you put the information in prompts, you have much of, because the bigger the prompt is also counted as the token. So as many prompts you're putting in. So if your information is small enough, yes. But what if your information is say you know pages and pages of policies and some other uh, concluded information that's and it's used fairly regularly. Um, and for multiple use cases, for larger scenarios like that, this is what I think you would. One, one thing that you said previously, um, your tokens in your prompt when you actually send it off, that's counted towards your credits in. in oh, yeah. the, like, it does. So it does. both of them to combine become. Yeah, credits. absolutely. So you so don't want to rely on just prompts because that could get the similarly expensive, and you don't want to do a fine-tuned model for something that can be just you know set up in the prompt. So yeah. yeah they watch someone do it with. Um, they want to make a story. They they fit in stories and like prompts and responses, and end up costing them just an enormous amount of money. I said. Oh, I'm only spent six dollars. <laughs> <laughs> two months and three months. So. Not too bad. Yeah. And then yeah. they, they compared it to, right next to uh, the ChatGPT just normally, and the, he, they picked the ChatGPT more often than not. So he spent all his money pre, like fine tuning it, and then just decided this is just way too expensive. Yeah, yeah. I, I would, I would think that you know uh, maybe the fine tuning should get a bit more fine tuned as well. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, it's definitely an exciting area to play yeah. in. So if you haven't played in so far, please do go play. So is is there um... What does it go to first of all? It can't be doing both directly in parallel. I'm assuming that it's going through any fine tuning model building first, and then it's going to the generalized 
it's not even of... going to the generalized one. So once you've created the fine tune, let me get into the, um, the browser or even here, like we gave it a name to reach out to only this model. We didn't say to go it to query by itself or any of the other ones or chat GPT. We gave it that only go and talk to this model. This is a model we created on this particular date and time uh, for this account on base, basis of this. So, so, so that model is an embedding in its own right? That model came with a lot of knowledge and um, information itself. So it came with from the base of Curie, but now it has not, no association with Curie. If Curie gets trained more, it is not learning from Curie, but it will only learn from any any more training I will do to this model. So it's, it's snapshotting Curie. As is. Adding yours to it, your fine tuning data to it, and then you've got that as a static just, model it yourself. It's getting better and better or keeps getting more fine tuned based on every time I query it. So if I go in here and you know, I put, let me just see. Is it doing what traditionally used to be called transfer learning? As in you have a base model and the deep belief networks, they used to have just the top layer used to get tuned to your, to your your data, the the um, features and so on of the base model still bubble up, and you basically only tinker with the top layer. And you... I don't think it's uh, it's it's keeping track of once you've created the model. I don't think it's about it's actually keeping making that as a service, because that's what that would be. That would be more like a service model, right? You've used some base services, and then you're you've got more of a layer on top and then you still keep getting the feature updates or anything. Oh, no, I didn't mean that you get feature updates, that it's snapshot of the model. It's done a Curie model or a DaVinci model first. It's got its parameters. You provide information and that changes some of the parameters or the weights within the model. And when you say that, you say that, that solution. So you've got the complete depth of the original starting model just that some of the layers now have had their weights changed to respond to your your absolutely you can definitely fix that for an for a application and then when you do go straight into maybe you know your playground or if you go into um, uh, you know any other application you can definitely update the so let's just keep that. You can definitely, um, yeah. uh, you know, change your parameters and things like that. So here as well, I could provide, you know, uh, different kind of start and end sequences and things like that. It's very true. Sorry. Very cool. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Oh, it's not me, but sure. <laughs> um, any other questions here? Yeah. Um, so. People are using this tool to answer questions in a way they previously would have gone into a search engine and seen a bunch of results. But the difference with this is it comes out with a definitive answer and says this is the answer to that question. I wouldn't say it. I wouldn't. Well, that's how people. I, I would say it. It gives you a conversation. It is more empathetic and it's more like if you were having a conversation. I don't think it says that what I'm saying is more factual. It doesn't even give you a reference. Sure, but in the Q&A, basically, you'll ask it something and it will give you a recommendation. An yeah, an answer. Are you concerned with any inherent biases in that approach? Oh, to yeah, this is the answer absolutely. based on arbitrarily how it's trained. That's why you need to think about what you're training and the purposes you're using it for. So uh, technology as everything is as you know, we train it or models are as we train it. So it's the data that you're using to train it is really important. And you would expect that the people who are training the base model are also from, uh, doing that level of, you know, uh, thinking around the bias and thinking about like we've been talking about test. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, we've been talking so much about the um, autopilot of uh, electric cars. Like if you are driving on autopilot and you know a dog comes up and a human comes up or an old person comes up in front and a younger person, what does it do? The questions are, ethical questions are really, really difficult for even humans. It's our impulse that we some, a lot of times rely on. We can't feed it that. So the ethical, um, uh, you know, whole area around AI is, existing and it's definitely you know an important thing for um 
open AI as well. Uh, how do you share a model between two users? I see you have created the models under your username, so none of uh, your employee can use the same model because it is under your username. Yeah, <laughs> but no, yes, um, I should try that. I should try it with a different account as well. Um, but you would hope and expect that. You see the API key from your account. Sorry? Use the API key from your account. How yes, 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 yes. Yeah. So, but yeah, I, I would think that there is some level of separation uh, for, for technical purposes and, you know, uh, privacy purposes as well. Yeah. So, I think maybe when services come to uh, like Azure as copying of services, then that will make that problem process quite easier. Yeah. Yeah. How do we get onto the Microsoft exclusive uh, Azure? <laughs> you work for a very, you just told me you work for a very big company, so you should, you probably would get before me. <laughs> but what you can do is uh, when you want it, you go here and click on Open AI. Yeah. And when you do that, it, 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 you'll get here quite easily. Uh, click on create and you will see that you don't have an option to do that. Ooh. That changed. That's just what happens with uh, Microsoft is already trying to says that. says that. says that. says that. says that. Application form. Yeah, so that's when you click the form. It's probably changed a bit that. It's letting me select a resource group, but it didn't even do that before. So this is the form, and you would see when you go through this form that they're very, very worried or very careful about the safe use of it. So they ask you what you're going to use it for, um, you know, uh, and uh, which model, you, which base model would you be interested in? What kind of application would you are you planning to build with it? So they go all the way um, in asking those questions, and then it this turnaround of this form is around 10 days. Um, and then, yeah. And then you get told no. So that's what happened to you? Or Microsoft employees get told no, no, because I tried it when I was still working for Microsoft. I get a no, got a no, and then I tried it through my company account and then got a no. But uh, the answer that I got was, it wasn't just a no, it's more like they are working with their managed um, uh, accounts. And if you compare it to, you know, the debacles we've seen for, I think, Google, and um, that you know they try to do just a live demo of their uh, their new model, and even that had a mistake. This one is you know like making it available to just anyone who fills in a form with the if I could use the word power, the power it comes with, you become responsible for any usage that would happen. So I can understand why they're going you know they're already ahead. They don't need to go any faster. So they're going cautiously, making you know. Um, all of these kind of things. But if you do work for a large company, you might get it easily enough. Thank you. Thank you very much. Imagine someone's done this already. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, and they, when they do ask, they ask you which ten subscriptions you want as well. So they apply on those subscriptions. It doesn't automatically go to every subscription. Thank you. Yep. Sorry, I have a question. So right now, right now this is Sora based on data that is frozen in 2021. That is. Like they have yep. to ask can this is a general question, not just for chat GPT. Can AI work on real time data? Like in a policy setting, let's say I am a city here. I ask some service from the government. It depends on my current situation, whatever it is, like center link or whatever. Can AI like real do real time data analysis and tell me this is uh, what your situation is? Like I don't know, like if I said it, like or oh, what um, what benefits I'm entitled to. To central link can AI do that? Less, less absolutely, sort of current, absolutely. Uh, it's like just without like pre-training and all those frozen data, like based on the current data as of now. Yeah, so it uh, it you will still have to train, so you can't really get anything. Trains, okay, but I'm telling the data. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So, so the example that I built, I was I choose to use my tendency to pick up sample users, but what I could have done uh, is connected to live LinkedIn APIs through a LinkedIn app. And then I would have got access to anyone's profile that I can see as my resources available, and that would have been live. And I could schedule my logic app there to run as often as I want to pick the new only LinkedIn accounts, not even you know do the whole thing every time. Every time, like five minutes, one minute, one day, one hour, I can run it as often as I want. And then my my model is as up to date with real time. Like real time is a Interesting definition. You can call it real time as one day old. No, real you time know, is real, real time. Like for example, the train schedule. 
Like, can I ask that, hey, I want to go from here to, I don't know, Gold Coast. The next 10 minutes, what turn should I take? Absolutely, absolutely, because that information even right now is being passed through APIs and databases and, you know, um, integration it services. Them, it is, some trade service may be disrupted right now. But yeah, it is, it, it is disrupted, say, in Central, but you will find out about it even if you were in Redcliffe. Yeah. How do you do that? Because it's being passed. The data is being passed into a database. So, does somebody to program this or open it automatically find all this thing out? On the basic? Like, that's the question. My question is, is there any manual work involved? Open will find, okay, this is the API, this is the district is adapted. I'll go to the past API and now I'll find what's the past API. that's up to there. us to design our solutions as to how we okay. want. Is what my assumption would be, but I'm happy for anyone to jump in. Sorry. <laughs> you need a Microsoft architect. There you go. It's also more uh, like training the model as well, right? So mm. it's uh, like we sort of said that there's a try, right? You know, if we put some data in, it may take five minutes or so to train, or depending on how much data we put in, again, it may take some time. So, I mean, yeah, like so the so mapping information from here to the Gold Coast is uh, is available. That's already, you know, potentially we can pull all that information in or number of train stops here to, to Redcliffe. Um, no no raw road is there, but then obviously the, the question would be how fast can you get the data in and how fast can you train the model to then make it then accessible, right? Uh, and so there is obviously some limitations around that, right? Just because training the model takes some time to right. And it depends on the kind of things. Sorry. I was just going to say, we've done a hybrid solution uh, where, similar to this, you use chat GPT or the open API to form the question. So you bring in the input from a human and you know, like the bus API or whatever it is that you need to hit, and it's like specific things. And you can train it to take whatever language people put in and make it usable on that API. And the response you get back, you can then put it through the trans language generation again to give a human answer back to them. And so it's kind of a hybrid approach because the public model at the moment doesn't have that latest information, but you can augment it with an API that does and just use it for the language process. And not everything will be, a, has to be an answer from an API or, or from a model for an application. Some of the things might still be relevant for a traditional database or, you know, a, a, a Cosmos DB kind of or a graph based database. So you might um, be able to combine that, use that for some filters, trying to get some just lookup information and then pass on the specific, uh, you know, learning type kind of questions that you need from the model itself. I just wonder after you apply this, if, if that's if you're going to use the similar like the way you train a model just within the uh, um, that's what models. I would uh, I would expect, but I haven't had an access, so uh, I can't. So when it. when the model is trained, are we going to expect that this model to be used in other services in the future? For example, the AI solutions or maybe other. You can use them right now, even if with them being external. So I would thank you. I would expect even more, no less. Is this, is this separate? I mean, is this anything different when you get it through Azure or you get it outside of Azure? Um, my is, uh, assumption is that, you know, it will be more integrated with your AD um, and um, so those things, security those things. things. Yes, but the actual functionality. Um, I, I would think that it will be quite similar. Maybe some uh, minor. It's its own company, isn't it? It's not like it's own, owned by Microsoft. It's just doing a... No, it's not owned entirely. It's Musk starting to go. Yeah, yeah. Microsoft has started. 40% so or something stake. It's a significant stake they had, but it's not owned by Microsoft. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Facebook's um, language model got released. Yeah, Lambda. To Lamba. run it, you need like 60 gigabytes of VRAM. <laughs> so, um, you know, that, that sort of limits who's actually going to run it. Um, is this sort of doing something similar where you're hosting? like a model on a server or is it just like another API? I'm just using a cloud API. I have no idea. It's a SaaS service for me. I, I'm not putting anything. I'm only paid $6. <laughs> 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 it's the year of now. Like, when was that? Were they well, cognitive the, services or Azure cognitive services? Or that was just, um, uh, so which one are you talking about? The, this one? Or, um, the logic app or the this thing that you're buying to now on the yeah, screen? This, this would become your Azure. Once you get this, so you would be paying um, to through as assuming that you would be paying through your Azure subscription. So if you're like hosting website owners, you'd be paying like, 
that per whatever it is, container or whatever. Um, are you doing the same thing with the language model? So you've got like your own instance, so you're not worrying about congestion or like what, what are you going to expect? I would expect it would be similar to how do you pay for the Azure Cognitive Services right now. How do we pay for that? Yeah. Yeah, same thing. So basically, you have the service, you deploy it in the environment. Now you become the owner of that. It's not no longer going to the public instance. Um, and you pay for that with your A subscription. So that subscription that has been billed at the end of every month, that's essentially where Tina six dollars will be coming out. Okay. The six dollars are going to be popular. Yeah. Thank you. I still have one more question. But it's more more for Microsoft. Um, it definitely should be more integration, deep integration with other services, because I know there is a plugin from ChatGPT that you can install on Dbeaver, and then you can just use human language to say what kind of things you can query, you want query, and that plugin knows about your database schema, and it would just, just translate the human language into a specific complicated query for you to use. So there are quite a lot of use cases that we, I would expect in Asia, for example, if I want to dig down into a certain error box. I don't want to write all, you know, complicated stuff. I just say, OK, show me whatever instance and whatever error I expect, and it will translate. Or for example, if the model knows about all my infrastructure stuff, I can just say, build me a certain pipeline to deploy to whatever places, so it can just do it for me. Is that, is that going to happen at all? It's probably coming, but let's talk about it afterwards. I'm happy to have that conversation. Yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> I have a question back. A anyone who has not asked a question has any questions? Thank you so much, Tina. That is Thank you. Thanks, they generated an awful lot of interest <laughs> and my curiosity, so that, that's great. That's lovely, lovely. Cool. That's, I think, a red bottle for me, right? That is, that is, that is a bottle for you, yes. And I'm sorry to say I get in fancier. They ran out of wine bags. So. <laughs> <laughs> you think you're going to get a bottle of wine? <laughs> you really Thank appreciate. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming tonight. Uh, when I ask you, please, to take your bottles outside the room, just put them, uh, put them outside, it'd be great. And keep your eye on meet up for next month's uh, topic. And that's the integration down under tomorrow night. Integration down under tomorrow night. That's the day for the next topic. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be this uh, Wednesday. Second most of the month. We are going to drink on tomorrow. Yeah, <laughs> 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 <laughs>